the Negro League teams always were, were scraping along financially. And in 1930, Wilkinson pulls the Monarchs out of the Negro National League and turns them into an exclusively barnstorming team. But the other very, very important thing he did, and many people believe that it, it, it probably saved black baseball, was he developed a portable lighting system that uh, you could take on trucks from place to place. You know, that enabled workers to uh, see night games. And he uh, invested everything he owned, but took the financial risk. Uh, his wife had a uh, antique store. He took everything out of that, put everything, all his money, probably around $50,000 at the time, which is a pretty significant sum, to get the uh, night baseball going, 1930. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello, friends. It's Tim Hanlon. How are you? Thanks for joining me here on the podcast. And uh, if you're new to Good Seats, still available, uh, we welcome you. And uh, if you are a regular listener, we welcome you as well. Uh, Today, uh, we are focused on our first conversation around the sport of baseball. Finally, yes, we get your emails and your tweets and your requests. And uh, and I think we're off to a, a, a fine start with this week's episode as we delve into the history of uh, certain aspects of the Negro Leagues uh, back in the earlier part of the 1900s. And um, our guest today, uh, Bill Young, uh, has authored a book on one of the teams uh, that was uh, a legacy standout in those uh, early days uh, in baseball history called the Kansas City Monarchs. And uh, he's written a, a tremendously interesting book about the founder of that team who has a, a, a great tie to the sport of baseball uh, before uh, launching the Monarchs uh, way back when in the um, uh, Negro National League back in the uh, in the 1920s um, and, uh, and certainly since then as well uh, by his posthumous uh, induction into the um, Baseball Hall of Fame. His name was J.L. Wilkinson. The book uh, that Bill Young has written. It's called J.L. Wilkinson and the Kansas City Monarchs uh, Trailblazers in Black Baseball. Uh, a tremendous uh, uh, writing, um, some very interesting stories that uh, we're going to talk to uh, Mr. Young about in a second. Uh, and I uh, encourage you to listen to it all the way through and uh, you will you will learn a lot as I did uh, and will continue to uh, in the uh, in the months to come. Uh, before we get to our conversation with, uh, with Bill Young, I do want to remind you that uh, we are indeed Again, sponsored by and brought to you by our friends at Audible. Uh, as you know, hopefully you know by now, and if you haven't uh, gone to our little website to uh, to find out more about it, shame on you. But Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles. Go ahead, count them. I'll wait. Uh, that you can choose from in just about every genre, whether that be business or romance or sci-fi, comedy, thrillers, uh, nonfiction, you name it. Uh, Audible probably has it. All their uh, titles from Audible play on uh, any device just about that you have or you can throw at them, whether it be iPhone or Kindle, Android-based, and more than 500 at last count uh, that will ensure that you can listen to your audiobooks anytime and anywhere. And as is referenced before, uh, and if you haven't done yet uh, already, uh, please, by all means, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats to get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible's uh, audiobooks. You must uh, try it out for yourself. It is, it's is—it's a wonderful service. Clearly, I don't recommend uh, many things without uh, believing in it, and this is one of those cases. audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free book, uh, your audiobook download, and your free 30-day free trial. Give it a try. Uh, I believe you will enjoy it. Uh, and if you don't, send me a note. I'll let me know that too, but I, I highly doubt it. Um, and we want to thank Audible again for their sponsorship of this here little podcast. All right, let's, uh, as we say, not waste any more time. Let us get to our very interesting and very intriguing conversation about the Kansas City Monarchs, uh, their founder, J.L. Wilkinson, Hall of Famer, he, uh, with our guest, Bill Young, here on the podcast. I guess perhaps the best place to start is uh, before we get into the uh, thick of the of the uh, the content here is mm-hmm. perhaps a bit about uh, how you uh, became interested in the topic of the Monarchs, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, um, uh, Negro League Baseball, all of it, uh, enough sure. to devote some time to to write 
uh, a, a really interesting tome uh, about it. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I can pinpoint the beginning of the project. It was uh, 2006. My wife and I were in Kansas City touring the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, which everyone should see. Uh, put that on. Put that on your list to, to visit. Uh, it's worth a special trip to Kansas City, but, but uh, absolutely a national treasure. And uh, we we're looking at the excellent exhibit about the history of uh, African American in baseball and came upon the a picture of the 1924 Negro Leagues World Series, which was the first uh, uh, World Series for black baseball. And they had a picture of one of the two teams in, in the series, the Kansas City Monarchs, all the players lined up. And on the end is this white guy. And I immediately thought, well, what is, what is a, a white man doing uh, with, the, with the black Kansas City Monarchs? His name I found was J. L. Wilkinson. He was the founder and owner of the of the Monarchs. Uh, and as I left the exhibit, I thought, boy, it would be interesting to to find out more about him. And as we left, uh, standing in the foyer there at the at the museum, is a very distinguished looking older uh, black gentleman. It's Buck O'Neill, uh, <laughs> who uh, is one of the most famous uh, Monarchs for sure. Certainly. Uh, and. He uh, spent a lot of time at the museum. He was one of the, the founders of the museum. And uh, I'm looking at a picture of uh, him signing uh, his autobiography. That's one of, one of my most treasured baseball uh, possessions. Uh, so that got me interested, and I picked up his autobiography. And I thought, well, Buck O'Neill also, he's, as a young boy in 1924, he's looking at that picture in the, in the uh, Chicago Defender, African American Weekly, and says, who's that white guy? <laughs> and, and, and he came to know him very well. So that was the genesis of the project. I had, uh, I was on, working on another book on uh, uh, John Tortoise Myers, one of the first Native Americans to star in Major League Baseball. So I had to finish that before I could get going on the, uh, on the Wilkinson and Monarchs project. Uh, but as I did, you know, first of all, I thought, has anybody done a, a biography of Wilkinson? No, nobody's done a, had done a, a biography of Wilkinson. There have been some work on the Monarchs and some excellent uh, histories of black baseball. That was the place to start. Uh, then I got in contact with uh, Wilkinson's uh, descendants, uh, his in, in his three grandchildren, uh, one who lives in St. Joseph, uh, and I, Ed Catron. I got a, went over and talked to Ed, and he brought in his uh, his two cousins, and we had a delightful conversation. And they they shared their memories of of, of JL and uh, his wife Bessie, and that really got me going and interested. And then there were uh, back in the 1970s, a researcher named Janet Bruce uh, recorded interviews with a lot of the Monarchs players, and those those are available uh, at the Missouri Historical Society for me. Uh, then I contacted the. Um, uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame, they're great. They are really great. Uh, they scanned their entire Wilkinson file, sent it off to me, helped me with pictures. Um, one of the things that uh, Ed Catron told me is that when uh, J.L. Wilkinson died in 1964, they threw away all the Monarchs files that, that, that he had in his office, unfortunately. Yeah. But he had a partner named Tom Baird, and Tom Baird's files are available at the University of Kansas uh, Research Library in, in Lawrence. So my wife and I were able to go there and, and, and uh, dig through those records and, and get a lot of great information. But most important, uh, in addition to lots of, of other primary research, was, uh, you know, the uh, white newspapers, white dailies, uh, in this case, the Kansas City Star in Kansas City, really didn't cover uh, Negro Leagues very much. Every once in a while, they, they, there'd be an article. But not very much, but the African American weeklies uh, gave a lot of coverage to uh, Negro Leagues teams. In this case, the Kansas City Call, which serendipitously began publication uh, 1919. The Monarchs were were founded in 1920, hmm. and so and they they continue to publish today the Kansas City Call weekly paper. And so I I spent many many days uh, with a microfilm of the uh, Kansas City Call and. That uh, that allows you to tell the narrative of the of, of the monarchs and and Wilkinson, so 
So that's, that's that's the story of the how I got going and and, and the research I did. So the but, the, uh, the story then is really the narrative is really about Wilkinson the man and I I guess right. the 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 his the the ultimate sort of expression of what he was about professionally uh, during right. his time with the Kansas City Monarchs. But I guess before right. the Monarchs came into place, I mean he was kind of like the original kind of barnstormer type, right? Almost a. Along the lines of an Abe Saperstein or, or these other types that were trying to kind of keep baseball yeah. kind of floating around. And ironically, he gave Abe, Abe Saperstein his start uh, later. Uh, he was uh, one of the first most successful baseball entrepreneurs, promoters, uh, who uh, just is kind of lost in the, in the midst of, uh, of baseball history. So I was delighted to be able to. Uh, shine, a, shine a spotlight on him. So just uh, just a quick background on, on J.L. Wilkinson. He was uh, born in, in Iowa, grew up in Iowa. His father was a uh, at one point president of a college. Uh, and it's obvious that they raised him to uh, have respect and tolerance for people of all of all uh, backgrounds and all races. Uh, he played baseball, uh, but he uh, broke his wrist and wasn't able to continue and 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 got into the business side. Uh, and his first uh, his first uh, team was a women's team, ironically enough. Uh, and uh, at that point, he 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 realized right from his first uh, go go with uh, the the women's team in 1908 that if you're going to succeed in anything, and if you're going to succeed in baseball, you got to have talent. So he he scoured uh, the Midwest and picked, got the best women players available. Uh, you have to uh, have first-rate talent uh, to, to succeed, uh, but you also uh, need to promote. So he, he traveled with uh, the women's team, and he brought along a wrestler. And so they go into these small towns. That was the other thing. He, he, he kind of pioneered this notion that you make money through barnstorming in small towns, kind of like the Walmart uh, uh, philosophy. <laughs> uh, and uh, he brought along a wrestler, and so after the game they would – the wrestler would challenge the the, the uh, strongest young man in the town to uh, to a wrestling match, uh, and so and the other thing he did was um, said you got to treat your players well. And and boy, you any monarch that talks about Wilkinson, the first thing they say is how well uh, he treated his players. And that began with his women's team. So he he uh, gets a Pullman train car, uh, and uh, that he can. Uh, take the players in and he d develops, this is going to be important later in this story, a portable uh, ballpark with uh, portable seats and portable canvas. So he can set up a ball field anywhere. Uh, so the guy is uh, already off to a good start. Well, it almost feels, 19 I'm sorry. It almost ahead. feels, it almost feels like there's sort of elements of sort of a small town, small, small time kind of circus element to it. No, you got it. You got it. And, and whenever there was a circus or a fair in town, he would bring his team, into to piggyback to, uh, to, to that. All right. But before before we get off the, the, the women's team for a second, uh, there is some sure. speculation around. I don't, I don't know how much you uh, devote to it in your book, but uh, it, it, were they all women on the team? No, no. Uh, uh, his team, they would have a few guys that would usually uh, dress in women's clothes or women's uniforms. Or, and they were called bloomers, back, bloomer girls back then because of, the, of this loose fitting kind of skirt type or pants type thing that they would wear, but probably the most famous uh, ball player to, uh, to begin his career in a woman's team was Rogers Hornsby of the great uh, St. Louis Cardinal. Uh, he began in Texas. I think it was uh, playing for women's teams. So that was not uncommon. What, what was the, what, uh, okay. But last thing on this one is it was the, do you think the crowd was in on the joke or was it truly a deceptive attempt? To... I think the crowd was in on the joke. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I, 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 I think so. But there's been some good work by women uh, scholars on 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 bloomers girls sports in the early part of the 20th century. They're very popular. It's a it, that's a, a fun little a fun little story, and and you can tell if uh, if it's ever a movie, it's a, an interesting element for sure. Uh, if so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but uh, so he learned quite a bit of sort of the promotional flair. How, how did that sort of uh, how did he evolve from that then? Well, the next, his next project was uh, in 1912. Um, by this time, very popular 
ethnic teams, black teams, uh, Native American teams, even some Hawaiian uh, teams, Cuban teams, uh, were, were barnstorming through the, through the Midwest and around the country. So his, he, he, what he would do would is take something and take it a next step. And for him, that meant uh, I'm going to have a team that has a, a multiplicity of ethnicities represented. And I'm going to call it the All Nations team. It began in 1912. Uh, and just tell you about t- two players on that team, one of whom is in the Hall of National Baseball Hall of Fame. That's Jose Mendez, for, for a, a Cuban. And the other is John Donaldson, uh, a left-handed pitcher from Missouri, uh, African-American, uh, 6,000 career strikeouts, for example. John McGraw said he would have paid $50,000 if, if he could have had a uh, black player. And that's an interesting uh, story with John McGraw and, and trying to sneak in uh, black players into onto his team. But, that, sure. but anyway, John Donaldson, uh, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And there's a, there's a uh, something called the Donaldson Network Online, run by a guy named Peter Gorton, which is trying to promote John Donaldson for the for the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He certainly deserves deserved to be in paper, players of that caliber. So again, he recruits the best. They play against uh, some of the some of the traveling black teams, and one of them is a team out of Chicago, uh, which I'm not sure it was then becomes the uh, Chicago American Giants, uh, owned sure. run by Rube Foster. Sure. So Wilkinson begins an association with Rube Foster that's going to become very important. So the one thing I would say about the uh, All Nations team is that they're playing, what, 1912 through 1918. Uh, some of the players get drafted into World War One, so it kind of fades, but it continues in various forms for quite some years. Uh, but you know, they're demonstrating in 1912 to 1918 what? That black and white and other ethnicities can play together on the same team quite successfully and that they can play at the highest caliber of, of the sport. Uh, and this is a time, uh, what, 1915, uh, birth of all nations, <laughs> yeah. uh, D.W. Griffiths, uh, film that, um, uh, with, with, with these ugly monstrous stereotypes of, of black men, uh, is popular. So, Sure, in the first what World Kale War, obviously. Did in his career had a great impact on race relations. It set the stage, uh, as we'll see later, for the integration of baseball with Jackie Robinson, who, who played for the Monarchs before he was signed by Branch Rickey. But J.O. Wilkinson is a racial reformer without, without really uh, claiming that label. He's not, out, he's not an out-front civil rights leader, never was. But what he's doing in his... Uh, with his teams, uh, with his players, with the people who work for him, is he said he's establishing a model of of races working together, respecting one another. Really important figure. Do you do you think that that was largely for a noble pursuit of this ideal, or do you think it was? more promotional and, and interesting and intriguing in nature or some yeah. combination of those two things? I, I would like to say it's, a, I, 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 it's not primarily in pursuit of a Nobel ideal any more than Branch Rickey's signing of Jackie Robinson was, was you know, that was business. And Branch Rickey said it was. And for, for, for Wilkinson, Wilkinson wanted to put the best product he could on the field. He's a baseball owner, promoter, a president, general manager, uh, he wants a product that's going to make money. Uh, his his uh, f- family believes that he would have gone into the white major leagues if he'd had the money, but he didn't. Uh, so, uh, no, so he, was, he, he didn't pursue uh, the Monarchs and, and black baseball as uh, – uh, as an ideal, he did it primarily because he knew he could he knew he could uh, succeed with it. But to succeed, he had to treat his people well, uh, and he had to uh, confront uh, discrimination. So, so he was primarily a businessman, I'd say. Well, it sounds like that that business approach, though, kind of got wrecked by like a lot of things the the, the <laughs> advent of the, the advent of the First World War. Yeah, yeah and right. In 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 that case. Uh, so in, in, in 1919, um, the worst, uh, race riots, uh, break out all across the country. Uh, and what's Wilkinson's response? Wilkinson's re- response is to, uh, 
call upon his friend Casey Stengel from Kansas City, who's in the major leagues, uh, and uh, to get a uh, exhibition game with some uh, black players and playing some some uh, major league players. So he, you know, I think he had in mind, although he was never public and he never really talked much about it, he had in mind doing things that helped with racial reconciliation. I mean, that was that was not his primary objective, but it certainly was, I think, important to him. Uh, but it's 1920 that the Negro Leagues get started, and I know you want to you want to talk about that. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I, I guess what I'm I'm really intrigued with is sort of uh, how does Wilkinson go from sort of the I guess, freer hand and promotional uh, uh, latitude, shall we say, of barnstorming into, uh, I guess, the beginnings of uh, something a little bit more uh, formal and, and regulated, right. I guess, and, and more, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, c- combined with other entities, uh, uh, you know, in, in a competition setting. Right. Um, w- once again, uh, Wilkinson took advantage of, of something that was getting started. And in this case, it was Rube Foster who had had tried hard to uh, get white owners to ac- accept uh, blacks onto their teams. He tried hard to integrate baseball. And, you know, this Jim Crow era, uh, separate segregation is well, in, well in, entrenched, entrenched. So that's not working. So Rube Foster says, we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to make black baseball work. Uh, Rube Foster is a, a genius. Uh, and so Wilkinson gets in line and uh, they form the uh, Negro National League in 1920. Uh, the organizational meetings in Kansas City, and although Wilkinson is behind the scenes promote, pr- primarily, uh, the organizational meeting is in, the t- in his town. Uh, so he's the only white owner in, in, in the Negro Leagues. Uh, and they had to... Uh, uh, Rube Foster had to be convinced, but by that point, he was pretty committed to having uh, black institutions uh, owned and run by blacks for blacks. And uh, so he had to uh, be convinced that uh, Wilkinson was, uh, that they should go along with Wilkinson and the monarchs. And the reason they did was because uh, Wilkinson had already, by 1920, established himself in in the, he'd moved from Des Moines to Kansas City about 1918, I think. And uh, or a little earlier than that, and he had established himself in the black community. Uh, he'd already had a couple of teams. He had the All Nations team, uh, and so he uh, he proposes uh, the Monarchs. They're accepted into the Negro National League, 1920, uh, and it gets going and it succeeds almost immediately uh, as a as a black institution with this white guy. <laughs> And for for a while, he's the only only really significant white person involved with 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 the, with the uh, Negro National League. Uh, and I, the, the relationship between um, uh, between uh, Ruben and, and and JL uh, was probably more than business. Then, right? I guess they both sort of saw similar his fa- things. His family his family recalls um, a friendship. I wouldn't say they were close friends. Um, not buddy. Not buddies. But certainly, very close business associates, and it uh, Foster, who's a, you know is a, every bit as bright as Wilkinson, realizes very quickly that this guy is good. Uh, he knows he knows how to succeed. He knows how to put a quality baseball product on uh, on the field, uh, and so they get along very well. And you know, you, you probably know the tragic story of Rube Foster. He uh, he uh, kind of mentally disintegrated, uh, and um, Wilkinson, I think, gave a eulogy uh, for him. So yeah, they they were close. Well, as the as the uh, and obviously <clears throat> obviously uh, Foster uh, running the uh, the Chicago American Giants, it, it seemed to be a, a, a quite almost an immediate uh, rivalry, at least on the field. Yeah, it was like the Cubs and the Cardinals, the uh, Yankee. Well, choose, choose your rival. That's the one that's <laughs> first and foremost on my mind. Uh, but yeah, they. Uh, th- I'll give you an example. The, they're they're playing Newt Newt, Newt Allen is the is the Monarchs' uh, shortstop, and Dave Malarcher, I think it is from the from the Ameri- Chicago American Giants. You know, slides hard. Uh, you, you could do that then in in second base and really spikes him badly. So the next time uh, Malarcher uh, is coming into second base, 
uh, Alan drills him in the forehead uh, with a, <laughs> and puts him out for uh, uh, cold for quite a for quite a while. That's the kind of thing that went on between the uh, American Giants and the Monarchs. But here's here's Wilkinson's response. He really gets upset with his players for uh, for the uh, on field uh, fighting. He said he was uh, he said I. I I want you to play hard. I want you to play aggressively, competitively, but I don't. I don't want this brawling. So he was much. He was very. He was very much in in favor of clean play. And this is something that kind of haunted the Negro leagues. Is this kind of reputation that these guys are are brawlers and uh, kind of that stereotype of that that w- w- was common. Uh, so yes, they were. Yes, they were intense competitors uh, and. Um, had some really rough rough games, but uh, Wilkinson did what he could to to to, to limit that. Well, it's clear it's clear though that the the games were were clearly passionate. There was a real uh, interest in in succeeding, and obviously what the I quality would say of about, play. What too. I would say about black ball, black baseball throughout uh, before the Negro Leagues and all the way through the the Negro Leagues, you know, and you know that they continue up into the 1950s, even almost to the 1960s. Of course, this, the integration of the major leagues really really is the death knell for, for Negro league baseball, but it's spirited play. It's fun play. Uh, it's, it's aggressive play, but you can tell these guys are having a great time out there. Uh, and, and, uh, of course the white responses to that, well, these guys are showboating. Uh, they are, um, uh, they're, they're, they're not taking the game seriously. Uh, responses like that, but, that's one of the things that, uh, of course, Jackie Robinson brought into Major League Baseball, wasn't it? That uh, exciting, spirited, uh, high-intensity uh, play. Well, I, I, su- I suspect that we'll, we'll get a lot more uh, deep into Negro League Baseball as our, as our fledgling podcast keeps going. But uh, I'd love to get maybe your initial take. I mean, at the time, right, um, it, it seems to me, certainly in, in hindsight, right, uh, and I'm, I'm a, an amateur historian for sure, uh, mm-hmm. But that the quality of play was not only as good as uh, the established baseball uh, yep. uh, world, but 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 in many cases uh, superior, uh, both individually as well as uh, as team effort, uh, if given the chance to prove it. You're absolutely right. And we have evidence for this. Uh, as soon as the Negro League started in 1920, um, in the in the after the regular season ended and, and there, uh, there were games against uh, white, white major leaguers, uh, Monarchs played Babe Ruth and a, uh, and a group of major leaguers in 1921 for the first time. And, um, and this continues uh, all, all through the history of Negro Leagues baseball, that there are exhibition games. The, a couple of the most famous, uh, 1934, Dizzy and his dean uh, and his brother Paul, uh, after after the famous Gas House Gang of the 1934 World Series, immediately after that World Series, they go on a, t- a tour with the uh, with the Monarchs. Uh, and what the major leaguer says one is these guys are as good as, in some cases, better than us. Dizzy Dean called Satchel Paige the best pitcher he'd ever seen. Uh, he said if if uh, Satchel and I were on the same team, we would uh, we would have the we would have the Pennant won by the Fourth of July, and we'd go fishing until the World Series. Uh, every every major league player, uh, Bob Feller, after before and after World War II, was heavily involved in in, in barnstorming with the Monarchs and other other Negro Leagues player teams. Joe DiMaggio uh, didn't really barnstorm very much, but they all said uh, these guys should be in the major leagues, talent wise. Uh, you know, not all of them, but 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 certainly the the best players of the Negro Leagues were just as good as the best players of the of the uh, Major League. So it's it's not a, a speculation. It's not a hypothesis. It's demonstrated uh, that the only thing keeping uh, blacks out of uh, so-called organized baseball was was racial discrimination. Would it be fair to say that the uh, the monarchs themselves uh, during the uh, uh, Negro National League's existence were the best team, or most dominant, or or, or most competitive, well, or one uh, of them? Uh, Rube Foster and the <laughs> and the uh, American Giants would contest that, but uh, bet- 
the, the, the uh, Monarchs were in the first, there are two Negro National Leagues. So the one, there was one that won, ran from 1920 to, uh, what, yeah, 31. And um, American Giants and Monarchs were, were, were clearly the two best teams in, in the first Negro National League. And then, then there was the uh, Eastern Color League that began a few years after the Negro National League. And uh, over there, uh, best teams were the uh, Hilldale, da- Hilldale Daisies of uh, near Philadelphia and the uh, sure. Homestead Grays near near Washington D.C. Probably sure. the two best teams. Although you'd you'd get some, um, yeah. So th- there were teams, there were players. Uh, the Kansas City Monarchs could have could have been in the could have been in the major leagues. The Homestead Grays could have been in the major leagues with the talent they had. Uh, some may dispute that the whole the teams, but uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty well established. Well, they they won the whole thing. Uh, not only the uh, 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 Negro National League title, but also in twenty four the uh, the first, I guess, the first uh, n- first right? Negro Na- National League uh, World Series, right? Um, so uh, obviously a dominant uh, uh, performance that year, but obviously uh, not a surprise, frankly. But uh, I, I'm really intrigued by. Uh, what you know, the fact that uh, Rube Foster was not only the the head of the Chicago American Giants, but he was also a head of the league. How yes, does that... Well, that should that 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 needs to be said for sure. He was the president uh, of the uh, Negro, Negro National League from 1920 until he he uh, had his mental breakdown. Uh, yeah, just you know, amazingly successful guy. Uh, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, he isn't. He he isn't a baseball hall of fame, but, uh, he's right up there with what, who would you, who would you identify as the best, uh, baseball executives, uh, in the, in the history of, of white baseball? Well, he's up there right up there with them, I think. Well, I'm really intrigued with sort of the dynamic though, between him and Wilkinson, given that they both own mm-hmm. separate teams and operate them. And right. then Rube is obviously, you know, ahead of the league. Very itself. competitive, and, yeah. very competitive. And, and, uh, Rube Foster would kind of try to throw his weight around because he's both president and uh, owner of of the American Giants and give them uh, some some advantage. And Wilkinson took ex- exception to that. Uh, you, you know, everybody says Wilkinson was a was a mo- mild mannered guy. Didn't never really showed his temper very much, but he could stand up for his guys. Well, but what? But but uh, in particular, though, uh, something interesting happened after uh, the the Monarchs won their first uh, combined world championship. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, Foster changed the um, changed the rules the next year. Um. Yeah. What are you? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Give me I, a hit I, there. What are you? My, no. Uh, fair enough. You, I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm at? guilty of doing uh, of of homework for this. I apologize. Um. Uh, my understanding is that uh, they changed the league schedule. Uh, the following year to a, a kind of a split season uh, approach. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, right. Yep. And yeah, um, so the, yeah, to his advantage, right? Obviously. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but, did, it didn't seem to stop. Well, okay, so let's let's uh, it, it, obviously the national the Negro National League was. Um, yeah, the one thing I would yeah, want to say about the twenty four World Series is that uh, baseball historians uh, say that uh, that twenty four series is among the best two or three uh, World Series major leagues or any uh, Negro leagues ever nine games, five, five, five game, five, four with one tie. Uh, Jose Mendez, the, uh, the Monarchs manager and pitcher uh, kind of drags himself out of a sick bed to, pe- to pitch the, uh, the final game. Just, you know, outstanding baseball. Yeah, so, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say. So, what what, uh, what ended the party, so to speak? Uh, the obviously uh, the the league was was you know uh, obviously doing well, certainly on the field and performing. Right. What, well, why the, did what, it? What ended demise? the Negro National League was the Great Depression, um, that uh, made you know people didn't have discretionary income to uh, to uh, go to games. At both in the in the you know the major league had enough history and and. Uh, uh, money to to keep going but the the negro league teams always were were scraping along financially uh and in 1930 wilkinson pulls the monarchs out of the negro national league and turns them into an exclusively barnstorming team uh but the other the other very very important thing he did and many people believe that it, it it probably saved black baseball was he developed a portable lighting system that uh, you could take on trucks from place to place 
you know, that enabled uh, workers to uh, uh, see night games uh, and uh, really uh, save, save. And he uh, invested everything he owned, but took, took the financial risk. Uh, his wife had a uh, antique store. He took everything out of that, uh, put everything, all his money, probably around fifty thousand dollars at the time, which is pretty significant sum, uh, to get this, uh, to get the. Uh, uh, night night baseball going 1930. Uh, the response from uh, most in the major leagues is uh, that you know this is a stunt. It will ne- you know never work. Nobody wants to see baseball at night. Um, but five years later, the major leagues, of course, are <laughs> are, are are playing playing night baseball. So innovator <laughs> again, uh, entrepreneur, risk taker, uh, but. Um, Pretty much saved black baseball for sure during the during the depression. So th- through the depression, he keeps the he keeps the uh, uh, monarchs out of out of uh, any league. He says it's not because I don't want to be part of a league. It's just that it's not financially viable. Uh, so 1937, he joins. He helps organize the Negro American League which was very successful uh, continued through the through into the 1950s uh with teams like the Birmingham Black Barons uh, that gave a start to a uh, a guy named Willie Mays again the Chicago American Giants the Monarchs Memphis Red Sox and then a controversial team you probably heard they first they they were first known as the Ethiopian Clowns and then they became the Indianapolis Clowns sure and they they were known for uh, putting on uh, kind of minstrel. No, nah, that's not the right word. They're putting on shows uh, that kind of, in the minds of some people, kind of played to the stereotypes uh, of whites toward toward black ball players. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know that's controversial. We'll, we'll, we'll say Wilkinson. Wilkinson sees that these, you know, these, the clowns are popular. People coming out to see them, both white and black uh, fans coming out to see them. Uh, they're putting on a good show, yes, but they're also playing great baseball. So he has the Monarchs uh, in a lot of series with the, uh, with with the clowns very, very, very successfully. And I think maybe the, the thinking has now changed a little bit about that these guys were. Yes, they were putting on a show, but they were talented entertainers as well as talented uh, ball players. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten-Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here, is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And now, back to our conversation. I'm really curious, though, as, as to how what's in Wilkinson's head when he decides that he wants to go back into a professional circuit again. Um, how instrumental was he in the formation of the Ameri- of the Negro American League 
or was he just a willing participant uh, to an organization started or, or contrived by others? Um, one of the things that's hard to, in part because all his records are gone, uh, and, and also because he was a really behind the scenes guy. Um, he didn't like to be out front in anything. Uh, you know, for the example, the monarchs, when, when they had the big opening day parade for the monarchs, he never rode in the, he never rode in the car. He put his uh, black, um, business manager, Quincy Gilmore, uh, kind of out front, uh, and was, was behind the scenes and in the formation of the first Negro national league, although he obviously played a very central role, it's kind of really hard to, to document that in the records. The same with the Negro American league. I think, uh, he certainly, uh, without him, I doubt it would have gotten started, but it's hard to exactly, what did he exactly do other than lend his, uh, by this point, by 1937, his, you know, three decade for three decade uh, uh, history of success in baseball promotion. Uh, he lends his name, he lends his credibility, but he's not, you know, he's not out there front. He's not holding the news conferences. He's not, uh, he's not uh, being interviewed on ESPN. Um, uh, if there were such a thing at the time. So interesting in terms of the, the role he played, obviously important, but not, not, not a, Never beaten his own drum for sure. Yeah, he, he strikes he strikes me as a uh, a, 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 a maybe perhaps a, a, a predecessor version of somebody say like a Lamar Hunt, somebody who we've explored over the years. Yeah, yeah, right. Very very you yeah. know yeah very uh, a quiet uh, gentle giant, but but behind the scenes obviously a uh, uh, you know hugely influential you got and it. important. That's that's a good, that that's a good comparison. Yeah, very definitely. Well, uh, you know, he's mm-hmm. every bit as much a. Uh, a baseball promoter and w- willing to use gimmicks as, uh, as, as, uh, Charlie Finley, but <laughs> Charlie Finley without all the pizzazz. Yeah. It almost seems like Wilkinson kind of, uh, understood the idea of entertainment and, and quote unquote gimmickry. Yes, he did. But yes, he did also recognize too, that that was more of a, perhaps a means to an end versus being an end in and of itself. Yeah. I think we need, we need to get to Satchel Page and Jackie Robinson. There are two, you know, the, the, the three, most well-known monarchs, uh, Jackie Robinson only played a couple months, but uh, Satchel Paige played a long time with the monarchs. And Buck O'Neill, the, the, those three, probably the, the most famous monarchs. Well, so let's talk about that then. So Wilkinson, obviously very well known for, uh, in either directly or indirectly, bringing in such great talent, obviously, uh, as the ages then showed uh, over time. Um, yep. But do you want to maybe circle around uh, how Robinson got into the into the family and how these others sort of uh, became part of, uh, yeah, can of I, the mix? Can I start briefly with uh, Satchel Page? He, he come he comes S- first in that in that chronology. Please certainly go right uh, ahead. 1938. Uh, Satchel Page has already been in in pro baseball for he started he started in 1926. Already been had already had a very successful 12 year career. Well known from jump for jumping from team to team, ignoring contracts, you know, taking the best deal or, or wherever to, wherever it was. And by 1938, Wilkinson and the Monarchs had taken advantage of that. They had they had they had rented Satchel Page from other teams to play for the Monarchs and, and particularly in exhibition games. Or and so in 1938, uh, uh, Satchel is signed with the Newark Eagles, and one of the most interesting uh, baseball executives, uh, Effa Manley. You ever heard of her? Well, the the only woman uh, in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, I think, uh, to, to to present. Uh, she was she and her husband were the owners of the Newark Eagles. They had purchased uh, Satchel Page's contract. Satchel Page ignored it. He went to Mexico. His arm went dead. Maybe a rotator cuff in, injury. We're really not sure. Uh, Satchel says that he's run out of uh, special oil that he uh, was given by the by the Sioux Indians when he was playing for a, a team in North Dakota that he was, they, they would rub on his arm uh, after, he, after every game he'd run out of it. And that was probably why his arm went dead. Anyway, his arm's dead. Nobody wants him. Wilkinson calls you, calls him up and says, you know, we'll take you, we'll take you Satchel. Would you want to play for us? Satchel comes to the Monarchs first couple of years. He plays on a traveling team. The Monarchs have their main team in Kansas city and then they have an exclusively traveling team while they're so he gets the best of both worlds, the barnstorming and the league affiliation. And uh, uh, Wilkinson, after a very short time, recognizes this you know, this guy's this guy's uh, popularity has not decreased. People want to see Satchel Page, so he call, he changes the name from the Kansas City Travelers or Kansas City Traveling Team to the 
to the uh, Satchel Page All Stars, and there it begins. To make a long, a long, long story very short, Satchel Page considered Jail Wilkinson the person who saved his career. Uh, they maintained a very close friendship. Um, Page considered him his mentor uh, all the way, all the way for the rest of Wilkinson's life. Oh wow! Very, uh, you could somebody could write a book just on Page and Wilkinson, uh, their 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 association for sure. But uh, you know, so Satchel ends up going to the major leagues. Uh, Bill Veck, another great baseball promoter, uh, signs him, uh, and uh, 1971 Satchel goes into the Hall of Fame. Uh, Ted Williams, you may know, played an important played an important role in 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 that, but. Uh, they put uh, they want to put they want to, they put Satchel as the first Negro Leagues player first not first Negro Leagues player to go into the Hall of Fame. They put it they're going to put a special wing not not in the hall not where the other plaques are but in but in a, another wing. And Satchel says, you know, Major League Baseball is turning me from a second class citizen into a second class immortal. Uh, <laughs> example of his humor. So that's Satchel Page. But uh, um, wow, what a guy. Well, certainly, and, and and that wasn't and, the last. And Wilkinson of it, right? recognizes the potential there. Uh, everybody, nobody else does. He's nobody else. Would, Satchel Page's career would have been over in 1938 had it not been for J.L. Wilkinson. And that you want to go to Robinson or well, you I was, yeah, anything? I was gonna, I mean, I was gonna say. I mean, that, that's that's clearly not the only sort of talent that he discovered sort of in the rough out no. there, right? So let's talk about Robinson. Obviously, a, oh, a, for a sure. gargantuan yeah. okay, figure, 19, right? You know, Jackie Robinson is a is a, is a nationally known uh, uh, ba- a football player uh, with the UCLA. He also played track, football, uh, football, track, baseball, and basketball. Football is clearly his, and track are his best sports. Uh, he's drafted into the Army. He is commissioned as a second lieutenant. Uh, he uh, uh, famously refuses to move to the back of the bus <laughs> before Rosa Parks, uh, an Army bus. He's court-martialed. He's found innocent, and he's uh, discharged from the army honorably. In, in November 1944, he doesn't know what he's going to do. He hasn't finished his UCLA degree. Uh, he doesn't have a college degree. What's he going to do? So he 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 hears from a Monarchs player. We're not exactly sure. Maybe been Hilton Smith, a, a really excellent, probably as just as good or better pitcher than Satchel Page. Uh, he contacts the Monarchs and Wilkinson, and and they sign him to play for the Monarchs in in the summer of. Uh, 1945, uh, and Jackie, who's uh, in in some ways not 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 the be- not the best player on the Monarchs for, for sure. You got Willard Brown, for example, a great home run hitter. You got Hilton Smith, a great pitcher. You have Satchel Page, all probably better players in a sense than Jackie Robinson. What does Jackie Robinson have? He has smarts. He certainly has character. And so when uh, when Branch Rickey uh, is looking for the first uh, black to sign. Uh, Wendell Smith, who is an important guy, also kind of lost in the midst of baseball history. Uh, a journalist uh, wrote for the uh, wrote for the various black newspapers, uh, and he's the one who recommends uh, uh, Robinson to to Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey interviews him. Clearly, sees this is the guy I want. So, what does Branch Rickey do? He asked Jackie Robinson, do you have a contract with the uh, Monarchs? And Jackie says, well, not really, no. Well, what the, the, the custom in the Negro Leagues was uh, your letter. Uh, when, the, when, you, when you receive a letter from the team, uh, that's the agreement. You don't, you don't have a formally signed contract at that point for the most part. So in, in technically right, he doesn't have a contract. So Rick, Ricky says, okay, fine, we'll take you. So the Monarchs are never paid anything uh, for Jackie Robinson. Kind of... Um, Branch Rickey is known him for many things, <laughs> but but he was being uh, uh, being uh, someone who was willing to p- pay money for anything <laughs> was not one of them. He was one of his nicknames was El Chipo. Uh, so uh, the response of the Monarchs is this is great. Uh, Jackie Robinson deserves an opportunity to, to to play Major League Baseball along with a number of other uh, Negro uh, leaguers. So um, Wilkinson and, and his partner, who we really haven't talked about, Tom Baird, uh, 
get behind uh, the signing of Robinson. Kind of quietly, they say, you know, don't you think you should <laughs> you should pay something for his contract? He, he, you know, they think he, they for sure think he's under contract with the, with the Monarchs. So, but but Jackie Robinson, he had played, uh, you know, on an integrated college, you know, one of the top college programs in the country. Uh, he, he didn't take well to the Jim Crow. Uh, uh, attitude that uh, he experienced traveling with the monarchs, particularly in the South, and uh, there are a couple famous stories. One of one one is uh, when they stop for gas, the monarchs stop for gas, and uh, the Robinson goes to use the restroom, and the owner of the gas station says, "No, no blacks allowed in the restrooms." And so he says, "Well, uh, take uh, we're not buying gas here." Uh, and the owner says, "Well, okay, you can use the restroom, but." Uh, uh, don't don't stay very long, and so from that point on, the, the monarchs never never, and they had been uh, stopping at stations which, which were segregated. And they never they never buy gas at a station that uh, doesn't allow them to use the facilities again. But um, so the, Robinson had a kind of rocky relationship with with them with with the monarch, not with Wilkinson. He got along very well with Wilkinson, but uh, he he didn't really like playing. He didn't like the travel schedule. Uh, and so he was ready to uh, he was ready to leave uh, that late summer of 1945 when the opportunity to to, to sign with the uh, with Ricky came along. But to, you know the conclusion here is that without uh, Wilkinson signing Robinson, he has no baseball career. He he uh, he uh, he's Wilkinson is instrumental in in the Jackie Robinson story, but. You know, everybody knows Branch Rickey, knows the Jackie Robinson story, but who knows the role played by the Monarchs and, and especially uh, J.L. Wilkinson? Well, it seems that uh, that Wilkinson and the Monarchs became uh, pretty well known for being a pipeline of African American oh, yeah. talent, right? Oh, yeah. uh, not sent, just they, Rick, sent, yeah. they sent more. <laughs> they sent more players to the major leagues uh, than any other Negro leagues team, for sure. Well, yeah, Robbins. Yeah, one, Robin. one of the most, one of the most uh, well-known, Ernie Banks. Um, cool Papa Bell. A lot of people have heard about Cool Papa. One of the uh, one of the uh, fastest uh, runners in, in baseball history. Uh, he was uh, he was managing the the Monarchs travel travel team in uh, what are we about to 1950, I guess, uh, and um, or late 40s, uh, and uh, he says to. Tom Barrett, who's taken over the team from Wilkinson by this point, uh, we, there's this guy down in, you know, you should, guy, this guy in Dallas that we should take a look at. And yeah, they say, oh, we don't need any more shortstops. But uh, Cool Papa says, look at him. So Buck O'Neill, who's uh, managing the Monarchs, uh, goes down and to Dallas. And without even seeing uh, Banks play with it, just on reputation, they, they, uh, they, sign, they sign Banks to the, uh, to the Monarchs. So... Ernie Banks, Elston Howard, just two, 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 two of the two of the greats who went to the Hank Thompson. Uh, yeah, I mean, it Elston, just seemed... Elston Howard, the first the first black uh, New York Yankee. Sure, and Hank Thompson. I mean, Willard Brown. You mentioned. Um, okay, well, yeah, so yeah, it, sure. It, it seems to me that that if anything could define success in the professional Negro leagues, the the Monarchs and Wilkinson. Uh, we're we're doing it. Um, why it. why then does he sell the team near the end of the decade? Uh, Good question. Forty, I guess we're talking nineteen forty eight is when he nineteen forty eight he sold his interest in the team. Um, he it was mostly because of health problems. His eyesight was almost gone by nineteen forty eight. He really couldn't couldn't read, couldn't see very well at all. Uh, he had a, he'd been in a couple of, a couple of bad car accidents with with uh, monarchs players uh and um he just wasn't up to it so his his uh co-owner um partner tom barrett goes all the way back to the beginning of the monarchs but talk about somebody who was really behind the scenes the players didn't even know he was associated with the team for years and years uh so uh wilkinson sells his interest in the monarchs to tom barrett but he's a, he's a smart business guy he retains the uh, the rights to the traveling team, and he uh, negotiates. He will get uh, basically half of uh, any any amount over I think a thousand dollars that 
a major league team or any white team pays for a monarch's players' contracts. By this time, every, you know, all the monarchs have very formal contracts. They've learned, they've learned that they've learned their lesson. Um, so he makes a good bit of money uh, on the monarchs after uh, after he sells, uh, and um, his son is traveling with the traveling team when uh, the call goes out to uh, Satch a page from the Cleveland Indians to uh, to, to sign with the Indians. Uh, so he gets he gets uh, he gets Bill Vack in contrast to uh, uh, Branch Rickey uh, was willing to pay uh, for the contracts of, of black players that he signed. Uh, including Larry Doby, uh, you know, who's the first black to go into the American League. So, yeah, so Wilkinson's out by 48. The, the Monarchs continue. Uh, frankly, Baird uses them pretty much as a pipeline to sell players uh, to, to, that, to, the, to the white teams, white major leagues and minor leagues. Uh, but uh, there's, there's an effort made to kind of fold the Negro Leagues into the organized baseball uh, make them a part of the structure of orga- white organized baseball, rebuked, <laughs> rebuffed. The attitude uh, of w- white baseball magnets toward, toward the Negro Leagues kind of throughout is that these are, these are rackets. Uh, these are run by unscrupulous men, uh, numbers, gamblers, numbers, racketeers, gamblers. Uh, and it's, they're not really businesses. Uh, you know, and they, we will, we will not, we will not dignify them with, uh, with recognizing them. We'll, 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 we'll take out, we'll take their best players and turn them into, uh, uh, white, you know, major or minor leaguers, but we, you know, we're not, we don't want their teams are, they're, they're sullied. They're, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it, you know, it's clearly a racist, uh, uh, racist perspective that, uh, uh, continues well into the forties, into the fifties, uh, the Negro American League hangs on uh, for a while, but one by one the teams fade. The Monarchs kind of really kind of fade gradually away. Uh, they're bought by a guy named Ted Raspberry, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, they can't make payroll. Uh, guys just kind of leave the team, and so it's hard to pinpoint exactly when. But by the early '60s, uh, the Monarchs are are no more. Well, this is also part of a, it's against a backdrop of the uh, steady integration of the major leagues. Finally, oh right? gosh, yes. And, right, yeah. So, yeah. in essence, the 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 existence or the need the Monarchs, for... you know, they're they're in Kansas City, and who comes into Kansas City? <laughs> the Athletics, right? Philadelphia Athletics are sold, become the Kansas City Athletics, and who's the owner? Uh, well, eventually Charlie Finley, right? So, yep. uh, and. Uh, so the monarchs, they have never owned their own ballpark. Throughout all the years of their existence, they have to rent uh, the uh, white minor league ballpark. And by the by, the '40s, it's a New York Yankee uh, minor league team, the Kansas City Blues. Uh, and so they're, I found in Tom Baird's records, uh, they're they're charging the monarchs, you know, for cleaning the bathrooms and for. <laughs> You know, all sorts of stuff, and it just, uh, just squeezing them, uh, squeezing them uh, to the point that they're that they're not no longer financially viable. And you know, I I have in the book a picture of uh, after Robinson signed with the uh, with the um, Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, there, there's a special train to take uh, people from Kansas City to to St. Louis to see to see uh, Robinson when he's when the Dodgers are playing the uh, Dodgers are playing the Cardinals, and that's just you know that's just a clear, <laughs> very clear indication of what's happening is that you know black fans are they're following uh, Robinson and, and and the other other blacks that are in the major leagues, and the interest level in the in the Negro leagues is 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 fading. They're not getting any support from from uh, white white baseball, so uh, they're doomed. So what what of Wilkinson then during that time? He obviously it was probably becoming more disengaged, if not even not yeah. even involved anymore. What, what, where what did he do? Where did he go? What what eventually? Where did he end up? Yeah. yeah. Well, he stays in Kansas City. Um, he, uh, as I mentioned, his wife Bessie is a <laughs> she's a she's a delightful person in, in her own right. Uh, very successful uh, business owner of uh, antique shops and. One of the things is she turned Satchel Page on to uh, 
to collecting antiques. So imagine, imagine what you know about Satchel Page as a uh, connoisseur of fine, fine antiques. Um, and um, so he helps out. He, he kind of helps out Bessie with the, with the antique shop. His 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 grandkids remember him as a delightful delightful grandfather who doted on his grandchildren. But they also remember he's pretty much confined to his home at this point. So who drops by? Uh, Satchel Page a lot. Uh, Jackie Robinson, interestingly enough, uh, um, paid attention to, to Wilkinson in those later years. Um, and other John, John Donaldson was probably maybe his closest friend. And uh, his grandson, Ed Catron, remembers that uh, John Donaldson, who uh, signed on as one of the first scouts, uh, he was with the White Sox as one of the first uh, Af- African-American scouts and quit when they refused to sign uh, Willie Mays. I think it was, yeah, Willie Mays. Um, he remember, Ed Catron remembers John Donaldson at his grandfather's funeral with tears uh, running down his face, standing there at the, at the, at the grave site, uh, just emblematic of, you know, and John Donaldson goes all the way back to all nations days and then played for the monarchs uh, emblematic of the kind of friendship relationship that this largely humble uh, um, guy um, had with, uh, with, uh, with, with his players uh, truly an incredible story, and I, it was just I, I consider it a real privilege to to be able to uh, bring him more to light. I, 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 his story certainly deserves to be to be told. I, just the final thing I want to make sure we get get, get included is that, of course, in 2006, uh, after after a study of uh, Af- African Americans in baseball, um, Wilkinson is one of a few. Negro Leagues owners who were inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So his 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 contributions have been recognized by those who know. <laughs> why why do you think it took nearly forty years since his passing to to finally achieve that? Was it just simply a knowledge or lack thereof of his influence and story? Yeah, well, well, in my in my epilogue in the book, I tell the story of 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 how uh, how African Americans that relationship between African Americans and the National Baseball Hall of Fame and to put it to put it kindly it's a it's a checkered it's a checkered uh, story uh, uh and uh, you know Satchel Page doesn't go until 1971 and then there's a slow kind of drip 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 we're only going to allow one in a year uh and then finally there's a study commissioned by Major League Baseball uh to, to, that takes place culminates with the admission of Wilkinson and a number of other uh executives and mostly players in 2006. So there was that kind of big push that was, uh, took place that led to his induction and that of an, uh, other very deserving players. But the two monarchs who ought to be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, and I, uh, I fight hard to get them in, Buck O'Neill, who missed by one vote in, in this 2006 uh, election. But Buck, Buck said in 2006, uh, you know, I'm just so glad that my my good friend JL got in because I think he deserved he deserved to be. And I don't care about myself, but Wilkinson certainly d- deserved to deserve to be in. Buck said that I've known two two men without prejudice in my life. One was my father, and the other was JL Wilkinson. So, uh, well, why did it take so long? I don't know. Inertia. Uh, but fortunately, there were a group of very dedicated uh, historians of black baseball. Uh, they're, a whole, they're, a, they're a large group. I won't name any because I don't want to leave somebody out who, who uh, kept alive the story of the Negro Leagues and, 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 and people like uh, J.L. Wilkinson. You know, he was, he's a J.L., uh, J. Leslie Wilkinson, the J. His parents said, we're not going to tell you what the J stands for. You'll have to figure that out. <laughs> so he, ne- he, ne- he never he never chose he, he never chose anything. Although uh, you'll see in the in, in records you'll see him called John L. Wilkinson or James L. Wilkinson, but just JL. His players called him Wilkie. It sounds like 
he's almost sort of the story's history is almost uh, Hollywood movie quality in some respects. Have you ever been approached or discussed that idea? <laughs> is there enough there? Do you, do you think? Contacts? <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, it, this is a t- so some of the things that we've talked about already on this show. I think with, so. Yeah, I mean, I think so. You know, uh, forty two showed that uh, that the story of 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 black baseball, obviously through the through 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 Jackie Robinson, uh, needs to be told. And there have been a, several other cinematic attempts, uh, so, you know, none ver- none really successful, too successful. Uh, to, to deal with black baseball, but I'd like to see it, you know, certainly Rube Foster, but, but, but the story of J.L. Wilkinson is, is fascinating. And although he's a, he's a mild mannered meat guy, didn't smoke, didn't drink, uh, didn't cause, <laughs> didn't, didn't cause problems. Uh, well, you know, a good screenwriter could, could, uh, could turn it into a great story. I think. Yeah. That's ne- it's never stopped the, the Hollywood filmmaking machine from, from, from attempting that. But, but again, you know, the influence, right. I mean, you've, we, uh, we've spent the yeah, last right. hour going through the, the names and the people and the, and the dynamics that, that he influenced and obviously finally, you know, recognizing at least in baseball's hall of fame. But, um, I guess we'll put it out there to our listeners. I, you know, we're about two months into this sort of this journey. Well, congratulations I, on a well, really great project. Well, it's, I, 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 I don't, I don't know if there's any congratulations need, but I, I am I am every day surprised at how these stories sort of uh, get disseminated or listened to, uh, and then the uh, response that we get from various people through our various social Wonderful. channels, et cetera. So you never know, and uh, this this conversation will live on for uh, many months to come. So uh, perhaps we can uh, stir somebody's interest out there, perhaps in in the well, Hollywood uh, machinery out there. Can can I put can we name can we get the can I name the title of the book? Oh yes, that let us uh, let us do that. Uh, our guest has been Bill Young, and the book is called J. L. Wilkinson and the Kansas City Monarchs: Trailblazers in Black Baseball. Uh, it is published yeah. by Mac, it is published by McFarland. Uh, it is available everywhere uh, books are sold. You will you'll be able to find a link to it on our website when this show posts. Great. Um, and, uh, and and rest assured, Bill, we will uh, plug the book both before and after our little interview here. Uh, okay. And I can't thank you enough for uh, for joining us and, and uh, enlightening us on this uh, on this area of uh, professional baseball. And for what it's worth, uh, you have uh, become the first uh, conversation in the sport of baseball for our little podcast. Uh, <laughs> there's no trophy for that, but we do appreciate it nonetheless. Sure, sure thing. Well, Tom, uh, keep up the good work. Uh, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Bill, my thanks to you. I appreciate it, especially uh, uh, this weekend, and uh, look forward to uh, keeping connected. And hopefully, we'll get some more interest around Wilkinson and the story going forward for you. Okay, there you have it. There's our uh, very interesting conversation with uh, author Bill Young. Uh, His book, again, is titled J.L. Wilkinson and the Kansas City Monarchs, Trailblazers in Black Baseball. It is published by McFarland. Uh, It is available wherever good books are found. Uh, You can find a link to the book uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Bill also uh, wrote a book a few years earlier uh, about uh, one of the first Native Americans to star in Major League Baseball. Uh, That book is called John Tortoise, Chief Myers, a baseball biography that was published by McFarlane in 2012. Uh, Again, that is also available where good books are found, and you'll find a link to that book as well on goodseatsstillavailable.com, our website. Uh, And in addition to going to our website for all that other good stuff, including the ability to send us some email or sign up for our email newsletter, etc., please, indeed, follow us on uh, social media. We love your tweets and commentary. Uh, it's a great way to keep in touch with uh, what we're doing here on the show and uh, be involved, suggest uh, ideas, etc. cetera. Uh, on Twitter, that's Good Seats Still. That's at Good Seats Still. That's where you'll find us on Twitter. Uh, we're on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Follow us there. We've got some nice imagery and, and uh, uh, blasts from the past from uh, various photographers and uh, keepers of the uh, photographic flame, shall we say, of sports history. Uh, you will find us on Facebook. We have a page there devoted to the show. Uh, just about everywhere you can kind of think of, we're, uh, we're available and out there. So please look for us. Thank you for all your commentary. Thank you for your listenership. Please tell your friends if you like it and uh, have them listen and download and uh, rate and review and all that kind of good stuff. Until our next show, thank you again for listening and uh, take care, everybody. Take care.